Uh, all right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the online causal inference seminar. Uh, so today we have the pleasure of having a talk by Roshan Xiang from Emory University on efficient treatment effect estimation in observational studies under heterogeneous partial interference. Um, she will help help in the Q and A uh, with the questions by uh, Zhaonan Chi and uh, Tijo Liu. So they will be taking uh, care of some questions in the Q and A. They are also co-authors on this work. And after uh, this talk, we will have a discussion by Fabrizia Meali from University of Florence. So I hope you enjoyed the talk today. Before we move on, before I hand you off to Ying and we start the talk, I just wanna mention that on January 11th, we will have an interview with Hido Imbens, who is, uh, by the way, another co-author on this work. Um, and you are able to submit your questions to Hido uh, through a form that we have posted on our website next to his talk information or interview information. All right, so please feel free to use that. Um, I will now take it over to Ying, who will explain how we handle Q&A, uh, and then we will start the talk. Thanks, Emma. Uh, so please submit your questions in the Q&A section, and some will be addressed by the Q&A moderators, and I will raise some to Roshan. Thanks, and I'll hand over to Roshan. Uh, thanks, uh, Emma and Ying. Now, uh, let me share my screen. Great. Yeah, um, yeah. so uh, thank organizers very much for giving me an opportunity to present our recent work uh, at the Online Causal Inference Seminar. Today, I'm going to talk about the estimation of treatment effects in observational studies where the interference pattern among units is heterogeneous and depends on some observable features. This is a joint work with Zhao Nanqu, Xi Zhou Liu, and Hido Inbens. We will start with a brief introduction on the general concepts of interference, then provide some examples of heterogeneous interference. Heterogeneous interference is the main focus of this paper. And I will explain why it's important to consider the heterogeneous interference. In recent years, interference has drawn increasing attention in the study of treatment effects estimations. The literature has expanded to address more complex and rich empirical applications beyond the classical potential outcome framework. Where units are connected to and potentially interact with each other, such as in social networks or in online marketplaces. Interference, in short, means units treatment effects depend on the treatment assignments of other units, as illustrated by the example here. In this example, the green arrow denotes social network of influence and interaction channels. Some are bi-directional and some are unidirectional. The treatment is assigned to subjects A and F. The treatment has spillover effects on other subjects such as D, E, and B through the interaction channels and are denoted by the blue arrows. The exact mechanism of interference depends on the particular application. One can use the general potential outcome framework to capture the interference and spillover effects. So in this generalized version, the potential outcomes are defined by a unit's own and neighbors' treatment assignments. So now uh, let's think a bit more about this example. In social networks, some are influencers that interact with many subjects, and some are just regular subjects. You can imagine that in some cases, the spillover effects from the influencers might be larger than that from the regular subjects. 
as the observers tend to follow the influencers regular, rather than the regular subjects. The difference in spillover effects between the influencers and the regular subjects is one kind of heterogeneous interference. And I will show you more kinds in a few slides. So let's now um, look at a second example that might also have heterogeneous interference. And the data set of the second example is used in our empirical applications. This example is the friendship network data collected through the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health. This data set has rich information on adolescent health, academic performance, and friendship network. This data set has been used in a number of papers to study interference and spillover effects between the high school friends. For example, risky behaviors like smoking or taking marijuana may not only affect a student's own academic performance or health, but also affect the student's friend's academic performance or health. Even though interference has been thoroughly studied, the heterogeneity in interference is much less explored. And now let me be more specific about what heterogeneous interference means. In this paper, we consider two types of heterogeneous interference. First is that the spillover effects may vary with the types of units and the types of the treated neighbors. In these two illustrations, four students are friends with each other. Uh, two of them are female and two of them are male. The darker color denotes the treatment, and the lighter color denotes control. The uh, first type of, of hygienarity is that the spillover effects may vary by the gender. And the second type is that the spillover effects may also vary by whether the students has the gen same gender as the treated uh, friends or not. In addition, the direct treatment effects may also be heterogeneous. First, it may vary by whether it's the female or male students who is treated. And second, it may vary by whether the treated friends are female or male. In the ad health data, um, which is the data we use in our empirical applications, we do find some evidence of heterogeneous interference. We study the effects of uh, risky behavior, uh, smoking, on their academic performance. Their interference seems to vary with their gender. The left figure shows the estimated spillover effects of two smoking friends. The spillover effects on female seem to be different from the spillover effects on male. The right figure shows the direct treatment effects given a treated friend of the opposite gender. Again, it seems that the direct effects on female seem to be different from the direct effects on male. I hope I had convinced you that in some applications, the interference might be heterogeneous. Then the next question is why the heterogeneous interference is important. There are two main reasons. The first one is that even if what we care about is the conventional quantities, such as the average treatment effects, the estimation can be biased if we overlook the heterogeneous interference.
Now let's look at an example. In this example, our estimate is the conventional average treatment effect. But both the direct and spillover effects are heterogeneous and vary with different types of units. We consider three types of estimation approaches. And I will talk about the details of these three estimation approaches in the main results section in today's talk. Um, but at a high level, um, one is the conventional estimator that does not account for the interference, which is the right one in this histo histogram. The other two approaches account for interference and are both proposed um, in our paper. One assumes that the interference is homogeneous, which is the one in the middle histogram. And the other one uh, probably accounts for the heterogeneity in interference, which is the one on the left. This three plus shows the histogram of the estimation area uh, from these three approaches. The black dashed lines denotes the average estimation area, which we could think about as, as the bias. We can see that the estimation uh, um, of the conventional ATE is biased if we do not properly account for the heterogeneous interference. But the bias is reduced if at least we allow for interference, um, such as the homogeneous interference. We can see that by comparing this, uh, the middle one with the right one. The intuition for bias is that subpopulations are not properly weighted. In the observational studies, different subpopulations may have different propensities. And the propensities may vary by units and neighbor's characteristics. If we treat all neighbors the same, or if we ignore interference, then units are not properly weighted to fully adjust for the selection bias, which leads to a bias estimate of the ATE. So that is the first reason um, why it's important to account for the heterogeneous interference. The second reason is that um, in some other cases, what we care about is the heterogeneous direct and spillover effects. This can help the decision makers to optimally target the treatments to the most effective individuals, which has direct implication in reducing the cost or maximizing the welfare. Let me summarize the key contributions in our paper before I dive into the details. This paper studies the treatment effect estimation problem in observational studies with heterogeneous interference. We propose a conditional exchangeable framework that differentiates the units that are exchangeable with each other from those that are not exchangeable. We propose estimators for direct and spillover effects that are motivated by the conventional AIPW estimators. We show that our proposed estimators preserve the nice properties of the conventional AIPW. They are doubly robust, asymptotically normal, and semi-parametric efficient. Our estimators are quite general and robust to heterogeneous interference but we also want to mention that this actually comes at a cost. We show a bias variance trade-off between the robustness to interference and the estimation efficiency. Furthermore, to use our results in practice, we seek to provide the feasible variance estimators. The conventional plugin estimator is biased. And I will explain the reason in detail in the main results section in today's talk. 
Um, but at a high level, we correctly quantify the bias and we use the idea of matching and provide the debiased uh, matching based feasible variance estimator. We show that this feasible variance estimators are consistent. For the empirical applications, we use the ad health data to demonstrate the practical re relevance of our methods. We find evidence for smoking to have a negative direct and spillover effect on the academic performance. Our work is closely related to the literature to estimate the treatment effect with interference. In this literature, some use the observational data and some use the experimental data. Our work is closely connected to those in observational studies. Our framework is closest to Forestier, Arodi, and Miller's paper. And we are very fortunate to have Fabrizio, one of the co-authors in this paper, should be our uh, today's um, discussions. The other streams uh, in the observational studies use the alpha allocation strategies um, that propose estimators for direct and spillover effects given alpha fraction of treated units. This framework is particularly useful in epidemiology and in a large network. On the other hand, we estimate the direct and spillover effect for every possible number of treated neighbors. That is particularly relevant in applications where a unit uh, only has, uh, has interactions with a few other units, such as those based on um, friendship or family. For the literature in the experimental setting, there are two ways to think about uh, interference. One is to treat interference as nuisance and do not directly estimate it. The second is to directly estimate um, the direct and spillover effects. And the second one is conceptually similar to our approach. Let me set up our model and explain the key assumptions imposed in our paper. Suppose we have an undirected network with n units. This n units can be partitioned into m clusters. So um, in this plot, um, each inner circle uh, denotes a cluster. For simplicity, we assume that clusters are of the same size n. Uh, but in our paper, uh, we make it more general. There could be different types of units in the same cluster. The types could be defined by observed features, such as, for example, by gender or by family member. We use YC, um, XC, and ZC to denote the outcomes, covariates, and treatment assignments of all units within a cluster. For unit I in cluster C, we use CCI to denote the treatment assignments of unit I in cluster C. And we use parenthesis C to denote the treatment assignments of units in the same cluster as I, but excluding I. The outcome variables um, and covariates with subscript I and parenthesis I are defined analogously. We restrict the interference to happen between the units in the cluster 
but not across uh, clusters. Sobel refers to this um, interference pattern as the partial interference. So under the partial interference assumption, the potential outcome can then be defined by the treatment assignments of units in their same cluster. For example, um, in the ad health data, um, a student's academic performance depends on his or her own treatment assignment and his or her friend's treatment assignments, but does not depend on the students he or she does not know. For the identification purpose, um, we oppose uh, unconfoundedness um, and overlap assumptions. These two assumptions are analogous to the standard unconfoundedness and overlap assumptions, but are generalized to the setting with interference. They are defined by the treatment assignments and covariates of all units in a cluster. These two assumptions make sense under the partial interference assumption, where a unit only interfere with the other units within a cluster, but not the units uh, across clusters. These two assumptions are also imposed in a number of recent papers in observational studies uh, with interference. The most important assumption uh, in our paper is the partial exchangeability assumption. At a high level, this assumption is more general than the fully exchangeability assumption and allows for the heterogeneous interference and differentiates uh, from the previous work. Specifically, we assume that there are M types of units and each type defines a set I. In a special case where M is one, units are fully exchangeable, which is their setting in Forestier, Arodi, and Millis paper. When M is two, there are two types of units, uh, such as female or male, parents or children. For notation simplicity and for the ease of understanding, throughout this talk, we use the example of M to be two. But in fact, we allowed more general M in our paper. Given the partition of M sets, a unit's potential outcome is exchangeable with respect to arbitrary permutations of units in their same cluster, same subset. An important implication of the partial exchangeability is that we can greatly simplify their potential outcomes. In particular, we can reduce the vector of neighbor treatment assignments to a number of treated neighbors in each subset. In the ad health example, we can reduce the vector of all friends treatment assignments. Um, to uh, just the number of treated male friends and the number of treated female friends. And for the size follows, uh, we are going to use the red color to denote the uh, female students or friends. And we will use the blue color to denote the uh, male students or friends. Um, so now uh, let me pause here and see if there, there's any questions. Um, there is no outlying questions for now. Um, we can move to the next part. Okay, great. Um, next, uh, uh, we formally defines our um, estimates and we provide our um, estimators.
we consider two classes uh, of estimators, direct treatment effects um, and spillover effect. This is the definition of the um, direct effect. And um, the direct effect encompasses two types of hygienarity. First is that the direct effect may vary with the subset. For example, the direct effect um, on a female student, as shown on the left figure, may differ from the direct effect um, on a male student, um, as shown on the right. This type of hygienarity is conceptually similar to the hygienous treatment effect and the conditional average treatment effect in the conventional setting without interference. The second type of hygienarity is unique to our problem. Direct effects may vary with the number of and the type of treated neighbors. For example, the direct effect may differ by whether the treated friends um, are female or uh, male. So the left uh, figure denotes the direct effect on a female student with um, female treated friends. And then the right figure shows the direct effect on a female student uh, with a male treated friends that is uh, of the opposite gender. The second estimate um, is the spillover effects. Analogous to the direct effects, spillover effects also encompasses two types of hygienarity. One is that spillover effects may vary with the subset of the units. For example, the spillover effects on female students may differ from the spillover effects on male students. And second, um, the spillover effects may also vary with the number of and the type of treated neighbors. As shown in this example, the spillover effects from the same gender uh, may differ from the spillover effects from uh, a different gender of the treated neighbor. And also the spillover effects may vary with the number of the treated friends. We propose to generalize AIPW for direct and spillover effects. That is analogous to the conventional AIPW. So let's first have a brief review of the conventional AIPW. AIPW is the sum of the direct estimator um, and the inverse propensity weighting residual. AIPW enjoys the double robustness priority which means if either the propensity model or the outcome model is consistent, then AIPW is consistent. In addition, AIPW achieves the semi-parametric efficiency bond. Our generalized AIPW estimator at a high level also combines the direct estimator with IPW. But here, there are two major differences from the conventional AIPW. First is that both the propensity and outcome models are indexed by not just an individual's treatment assignment, but also the number of treated neighbors in each subset, uh, such as the number of treated female friends, G1, and the number of treated male friends, G2. Second is that we need to account for an individual's own and neighbor's covariance, given the generalized unconfidentness assumption, where the neighbor's covariance may affect an individual's own outcome and also the treatment assignments of all units in a cluster.
The journal has AIPW for other estimates, such as spillover effects, as defined analogously. The estimation of the outcome and propensity model is conceptually similar to the conventional case. Our theoretical analysis is based on the uh, CIF estimators, and we use the uh, CIF estimator to derive um, the uh, asymptotic properties um, of our estimator. However, we can also use um, machine learning estimators and also use the, the idea of cross-fitting uh, to avoid overfitting to estimate the outcome and propensity model. Um, okay, now uh, let me show you the main results in our paper. The main result uh, we show is that our generalized AIPW preserves the same nice priorities as the uh, conventional AIPW. Our generalized AIPW um, is consistent and asymptotically normal, um, enjoys the double robustness property and achieves um, the semi-parametric efficiency bond. To use the um, asymptotic normality results in practice, such as to uh, construct the confidence interval and conduct hypothesis test, we need to provide the feasible estimator for the asymptotic variance, uh, which is denoted by uh, we here. Um, one might want to use the plug-in estimator, but the plug-in estimator uh, is biased in our case. Um, the intuition is that the outcomes of units within the same cluster are correlated with each other because of their interference. And following this intuition, uh, we suggest a debiased estimator that subtracts the correlation of units outcome out. And furthermore, uh, we use a matching base idea uh, and we show that the debiased uh, matching base feasible estimator um, is consistent. Our framework and methods is robust to heterogeneous interference, um, but this comes at a cost. As we briefly mentioned in the intro section, uh, we suggest um, a hierarchy uh, of bias variance trade off in the robustness to hygienarity and interference versus efficiency. On the top of the hierarchy, the estimator assumes no interference and the estimator is the most efficient. At the bottom, the estimator allows for general interference. If we move from the top to the bottom, the estimator is robust to a more general interference pattern, but the cause is the efficiency loss. And in addition, if we allow for heterogeneity, there is also an efficiency loss. So let me use an example to be more specific about the uh, bias variance trade-off in the estimation of the treatment effects. Suppose we're interested in estimating the average treatment effects of female students, um, beta one. There are three approaches to estimate beta one, uh, identical to the three I mentioned in the intro part when I talk about the bias estimates of ATE. The first one assumes no interference um, and uses the conventional approach um, the conventional AIPW. And the second one assumes full uh, exchangeability, um, estimates the direct effects given every possible number of treated friends and average over this direct effect. So here um, we use G1 plus G2 to, to denote the uh, number of treated friends, and we do not differentiate the female treated friends from the male treated friends. 
The third one is the more general one where we assume the direct effects given every possible number of uh, treated female friends and the treated male friends and average over this direct effects. Both the second and the third approaches are proposed um, in uh, this paper. For these three estimation approaches, um, in our paper, we formally show the bias versus trade-off. The first approach is consistent only if there's no interference. The second approach is consistent if there's no interference or there is partial interference. But units are fully uh, exchangeable. The third one um, is the most general one. If all the three approaches um, are consistent, then the first approach, um, assuming uh, no interference, mm -hmm. is the most efficient one. And followed by the second one, uh, assume um, the homogeneous interference. And then the uh, third one, uh, allow, allowing for the heterogeneous interference is the least efficient one. This theorem um, we show in our paper as it also holds for other estimates like spillover effects and holds for more than two subsets. The takeaway from this theorem is that we want to use as parsimonial uh, interference um, structure or conditional exchangeability structure as possible for the efficiency consideration. But how can we identify the most parsimonious interference structure? We could start with the more flexible and robust structure, and then we can run hypothesis tests for the interference and heterogeneity and see if we can potentially simplify the interference structure. We have seen the bias histogram in the intro part. Um, here uh, we propose um, the variance trade-off. When the data draining process uh, does not have any interference, all three types of estimators are unbiased. And the mean square arrow is, denote, is shown um, in the parentheses here. Um, as we can see, the correct specification, uh, in other words, um, the estimation approach assuming no interference um, um, is the most efficient, followed by the one, um, assuming homogeneous interference. And the least efficient one is the most general one allowing for uh, heterogeneous interference. Next, uh, we apply the three estimation methods on the at health data to study the impact of risky behavior, uh, smoking on the academic performance. All three methods indicate that smoking has a um, negative impact on the academic performance. Um, it means even if we account for hygienic interference, there's still a significant negative impact, though um, the point estimator um, is smaller uh, for this most robust approach. Um, and in addition, the confidence interval for this robust approach is widest and followed by the one uh, that assumes homogeneous interference. And the one assumes no interference uh, has the largest point estimates and the narrowest uh, confidence interval. So uh, this result um, is aligned uh, with our bias burns trade-off. Um, so I'm going to pause here and see if there's any question. Um, our Q&A moderators has perfectly addressed all the open questions. So, um, can I ask a short question? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. So uh, it's it's really uh, nice how you've compared all these different strategies. I, I'm just going to ask like a general question and if it's uh, just stopping, I'm, I'm not an expert on interference, but um, 
Yeah, so the it seems that the, this assumption of partial interference is important for your theorem one because of the M clusters. But I can imagine that like in reality, there's some like tightly connected clusters and then maybe some weak connections between the clusters. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any idea kind of how uh, how like how bad would it be to ignore these like weak connections between the clusters and kind of, you know, just use just the tightly connected clusters and assume partial interference. So under some small violations of this, how the estimator would behave. Um, yeah, so uh, this is a um, great question. Um, so if, um, so we do accounts for the weakly uh, connected clusters um, in their um, extension. Um, and if the weak, connect, uh, weak connection uh, is sufficiently weak, say um, the connection uh, is at a smaller order of um, and the number of uh, units, it grows slowly with the, the network size. Um, then uh, this connection um, would be a smaller order term. Um, and um, so our results um, could, um, say, uh, could continue to hold in that case. But um, if it's really hard to uh, partition their units in a cluster. Um, then uh, one approach is we could um, say accounts for, um, so the, the, the ego units um, in each uh, cluster. So we can uh, study the ego units, but instead of um, its uh, neighbors, um, all the neighbors. So in that case, um, basically we can still um, mostly or almost satisfied there are uh, some kinds of um, independence assumption. And, um, and then um, um, we would expect the, um, so our results uh, would hold um, in Great. that case. Great, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, so now uh, I want to use the last uh, few minutes to talk about the uh, extensions uh, considered in our paper. Um, first is that we provide the complete results for varying cluster size, including the estimators for direct and spillover effects in this case. And the asymptotic priorities, um, and we provide the asymptotic priorities of these estimators. Uh, second is that we allow for um, more uh, flexible interference structure. Um, and we allow that the units in the clusters are not fully connected uh, with each other. Uh, for example, um, this allows for the case where a student um, has many friends, but um, his or her friends are not friends with each other and do not interfere uh, with each other. And the uh, third extension we consider uh, is that the uh, clusters are weakly connected uh, with each other. And related to the uh, question um, just now. And the fourth um, extension is that we consider some other estimates that are analogous to ATT and CATE, and we provide the estimators for this estimate. The last one is analogous to the alpha allocation strategy, where the size of the clusters are large, such as a village uh, as a cluster. In, in this case, we can instead use the fraction of the uh, treated neighbors, and then the fraction can be viewed as the continuous treatment index. Um, so for this case, we could uh, generalize our estimator uh, to allow for the uh, continuous treatment index, and uh, we could show that our uh, asymptotic results uh, continue to hold in this case. So now uh, let me write up. Uh, in this paper, we uh, studies the uh, treatment effect estimation problem in observational studies under partial interference. We propose a conditional exchangeable framework for heterogeneous interference. Um, and we uh, provide the generalized AIPW estimators for direct and spillover effects in observational studies. Uh, we show that our estimators are doubly robust 
uh, some totally normal and semi-parametric efficiency. The conventional plug-in estimators are biased. Uh, to address that problem, uh, we propose the de-biased uh, matching-based uh, feasible variance estimators that are consistent. And we show a biased variance trade-off between the robustness to interference and estimation efficiency. Um, and in the end, we applied our methods to the ad health data, even though I didn't uh, have much time to talk about our empirical results in detail. Uh, for the empirical application, we demonstrate the practical relevance of our framework and methods. Um, and we found um, the direct and spillover effects of the risky behavior uh, on the um, academic performance. That's all for my talk. Um, and uh, thank you all uh, for your attention. Great. <clears throat> thank you so much, Rosha. Mm -hmm. um, so I think maybe we move on to the discussion next, mm -hmm. and then we'll um, answer some questions that come up after that. So please, yeah, feel free. Thank you. So can you hear me now? Yes. <clears throat> and also, I'm sharing my screen. Looks great. Great. So thanks a lot for the invitation to discuss this paper. And I would also like to thank uh, Zheng uh, Wang for helping me uh, putting together this uh, discussion. Um, so let me see. OK. So um, indeed, um, um, these, uh, I'm happy to discuss this paper that essentially extends um, uh, our, the estimate in uh, our paper by uh, Laura Forastiere, myself and, and Edu Airoldi, in that they allow for uh, interference to be heterogeneous. Uh, and indeed, in our uh, network uh, SUTVA assumption, uh, despite um, allowing the G function that defines the neighborhood treatment uh, to be very general, uh, indeed, in, uh, in the paper and in the application of the uh, proposed estimator, we essentially uh, always define G as the number of treated units or, um, sorry, the number of treated neighbors or the proportion of treated neighbors, therefore uh, implicitly assuming exchangeability of the neighbors irrespective of their uh, type. Um, and I found it interesting that uh, they essentially uh, look at uh, heterogeneity in both uh, uh, the units type as well as the, um, the types of the treated uh, uh, neighbors. Um, and again, as um, Rujan uh, just, just um, uh, described, uh, um, they, uh, in the paper, they develop a doubly robust um, IPW estimation with all of the extensions, including the uh, the weekly connected uh, clusters that Emma was uh, referring to uh, before. Uh, they also provide uh, asymptotic results for the estimator and experience. And they also show an interesting bias variance uh, uh, trade-off for the ACE. So I would like to start my uh, say discussion by uh, providing some first some comments on the estimate and 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 specifically I would like to give a, a further account of uh, how essentially different forms of um, or aspects of heterogeneity in observational uh, settings with interference have been um, tackled or approached or defined in, in the literature so far. So <clears throat> essentially, analogously to uh, what it is done in the paper by 
um, Bartley et al. that um, um, Rogen uh, mentioned uh, before, uh, <clears throat> when defining estimate, estimates using a, a treatment allocation strategy in a paper by uh, Georgia Papadogorgo uh, and Corey Ziegler, we essentially extended these uh, type of estimates uh, to allow for uh, units uh, receiving treatments within clusters uh, based on covariates, as opposed to the usual um, uh, treatment allocation strategies where uh, the probability of receiving treatment within um, any, uh, let's say, cluster is are constant and do not vary with the covariate. And this is a way of uh, formalizing and, and defining, uh, in our view, more realistic uh, counterfactual treatment allocation uh, programs and strategies to, to be contrasted um, that, again, are more realistic, especially in, in observational settings. The estimates that um, were proposed in Forastiere et al. that had been extended in the in the paper uh, that we are discussing today have all have also been extended um, uh, to different uh, to capture let's say different aspects of uh, interference heterogeneity in two other papers um, and again uh, they capture different sources of heterogeneity in Tortu et al heterogeneity stems from the fact that uh, the treatment is multivalued. And so interference depends on the proportion of your neighbors um, uh, being treated with different levels of the treatment. Whereas in Bargagli, Stoffi and all, et al, um, they consider um, uh, unit covariate um, um, uh, sorry, characteristics. So they they, uh, they consider um, both direct and spillover effect heterogeneity with respect to um, characteristics of the units or uh, their uh, neighbors. The difference with respect to what was just uh, proposed is that here the subgroups are data driven. They are not uh, specified a priori as in the paper that we are discussing today where the partition of uh, the units into these I, J um, subgroups is essentially defined uh, a priori and not uh, necessarily uh, data driven. A second comment uh, on the estimates is that you essentially, uh, when you show the, 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 the bias uh, variance trade-off, um, you call your target estimate an ATE, irrespective of being in a setting with or without interference. And that may, in principle, raise uh, some um, confusion in that when interference is there, the ACE, as we are normally used to interpret and, and, and define it, is actually not well defined. And even the usual Neiman contrast, namely what would happen on average if everybody uh, got the treatment versus everybody got control, um, is a function or captures both direct and spillover effects. And so this is just, um, so in fact, when interference is there, the uh, what you call the, the standard ACE, so your beta, which is very similar to what we call main effect tau in Forastiere et al., and what is usually what is called the E A C E in a recent paper by Xavier, um, uh, uh, Hudgens, and uh, um, sorry, Aronov. Um, uh, this is really not um, 
uh, NACE, uh, but it's the closest possible estimate to NACE. It's essentially a typical effect of a hypothetical intervention of changing the treatment of a single unit, possibly drawn at random from the uh, network. And it is defined by marginalizing over the treatment assignment distribution of uh, the neighbors, right? So it's, a, it's essentially different and, and it's looking at it let's say slightly different hypothetical um, intervention. And these, all these, uh, let's say, um, interference-based definition um, um, of um, an average treatment effect. So, so the beta, the beta, the main effect tau and the E, ACE, do coincide with the, with the usual ACE when this is well-defined, namely, when no interference um, under no interference. And so I'm just um, suggesting that uh, if you clarify this issue in the paper, this may also help uh, uh, clarifying and understanding what are the hypothetical interventions associated uh, to the estimates that you define uh, in the paper. Um, another comment I have is regards uh, the bias of the naive estimator, uh, because essentially you discuss uh, bias with respect to uh, the degree, let's say, of interference. But as we have shown, again, in the paper with Laura and Edo, um, bias depends also on the association between ZI and GI, namely the individual and the uh, neighborhood uh, treatment. And the naive estimator is unbiased for beta, or namely in our paper for feet, uh, for sorry, for tau, if ZI and GI are independent after conditioning on the, let's say, right confounders. And if these confounders are adjusted for in the naive estimator. So given that in the simulation section of your paper, the Z, uh, you simulate the ZI and the GI as being conditionally independent given these X, C that you define there. Uh, in principle, the naive estimators, uh, so for example, the, the usual IPW or double robust estimator that do not account for interference, if they include, let's say, the right confounders in your scenario, they should be unbiased uh, for uh, beta. So maybe I'm just uh, suggesting to maybe compare the proposed estimators with uh, you know, these naive estimations and see how they perform. Um, some comments also on, on inference, as we all know, uh, you know, all meaning all the people working with uh, uh, on causal inference on network uh, data and with interference in general, inference is, is difficult just because we need to account and measure uh, different sources of uncertainty. And as we have seen also in the paper that was presented today, uh, in order to gather, uh, you know, and rely on asymptotic results, for example, for getting a, um, an, an asymptotic approximation to the sampling uh, variance, um, this is also is usually at the cost of um, um, restricting the uh, putting restrictions on the network uh, topology, namely. Uh, allowing only for uh, non-overlapping clusters or, um, or also restrictions on the way the network uh, grows. And, and these assumptions and these restrictions may be uh, more or less um, you know, plausible depending on the setting. Uh, and of course, if they are not plausible, it is not clear what in fact, uh, what um, in fact the, um, 
you know, the estimation of these uh, of the variance really uh, captures. This is a reason, also one of the reasons why in the paper with Laura and Edo, we focused on finite population or finite network uh, estimates. And also in, 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 in both uh, Forastier et al. and Papadogorgo et al. paper, we actually showed in simulations that relatively simple, simple uh, resample uh, or resampling uh, uh, procedures um, actually uh, perform um, uh, rather well um, for, of course, for a specific type of um, uh, sampling uh, schemes, namely ego or, or cluster uh, sampling. And in, um, in a recent uh, paper also with Laura Edo and, and Albert uh, Wu that is forthcoming in the Journal of uh, Machine Learning, Learning uh, Research, uh, we uh, develop, let's say, a Bayesian uh, approach um, to inference um, on this uh, finite network uh, uh, estimate both for direct and spillover uh, effects that allow to account for dependent uh, Ys and, and Zs. Um, okay, so maybe this is something that you may also want to uh, consider, uh, you know, like maybe uh, contrasting your um, way of estimating uh, the variance with um, um, this type of um, resampling procedures or, or Bayesian procedures to derive uh, posterior, the posterior distribution or posterior variance uh, around these uh, estimates. Uh, very, fi very final, uh, possibly minor uh, comments and suggestion. Um, so first of all, you uh, you know, you suggest uh, conducting sensitivity analysis with respect to um, the heterogene um, heterogeneous uh, interference uh, pattern. Uh, but I'm just suggesting to maybe propose or uh, perform also sensitivity analysis with respect to other assumptions that you are uh, making, namely unconfoundedness, dependence on, on units outside um, the cluster, and so on. And, and then two uh, more specific um, questions related to the, the application that you were not able to, to discuss uh, in details. Um, so first of all, in the paper, um, the partition of the units into these IJ groups uh, is used for both identifying the interfering units and also to define the subgroups of units the estimate referred to. While in the adult application, it seems to me that two different partitions are used, namely female male to describe a heterogeneity in interference and then ego, non-ego, so that essentially the effect is only provided for the ego, not for the whole, for all the units in the, in the cluster. So maybe, um, you know, you want to align what it's in the main paper, let's say, main results and what you show in the empirical application. And then the very final question, because the, Adele's data are gathered using a two-stage sampling scheme with schools as primary um, sampling units. I was wondering whether these the sampling scheme has implications on the expression of the asymptotic variance. And of course, the papers that I mentioned are listed in this list, but um. I'm done with the discussion. Great, thank you Fabrizia for a detailed walk through the literature. Uh, so Roshan, uh, maybe you would like to respond. We're a bit over time, but we have definitely time to for a response. So. 
Yeah, so uh, these are all the uh, very good comments. And also this is uh, very helpful for us to um, clarify um, um, the contributions in our paper and um, uh, make comparison with uh, related work. And related to the um, ATE uh, one. Um, so in fact, um, we, um, and as far as that, it would be more precise to use the parenthesis ATE uh, to denote the uh, S demand. And, and in fact, we provide the um, precise definition of the parenthesis ATE in our paper. And that ATE, uh, in fact, uh, coincides with the uh, well-defined ATE, as you mentioned, uh, when there is no interference. Um, so, uh, but we will uh, be more precise um, uh, in our paper and also we will um, also make comparison with the, um, the uh, existing uh, definitions uh, related to, to that. Um, and um, yeah, so I think that is the um, uh, major response. And, and also for the other comments, they are very good comments and we will uh, think carefully. Um, and those are very helpful for us to improve our paper. Good, great. Thank great. you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, all right, so then uh, let's wrap up today's session. Uh, so first I just wanna thank, of course, uh, Roshan and, oh, sorry, I should probably do this as well. Okay, great, now you can see. Uh, so yes, first I wanna thank Roshan and Fabrizio for uh, their thoughtful discussions and a very detailed talk. Uh, clarified a lot of things for me. And I'd like to thank all of our helpful panelists in the Q&A for answering questions. Thank you all also for being here. So actually for the next few weeks, we'll be on a holiday break here at the Online Causal Inference Seminar. And we return on January 11th uh, with an interview with Hido Imbens from Stanford University. Uh, so you have an opportunity to submit questions for this interview. So for that, please visit our website and find the kind of interview listing. There will be a form where you can that you can use to submit your questions. So I hope you can do that. And yes, uh, thank you again for coming. And I hope you have a great holiday break. And we'll see you all next year.